Years ago, I said the Rode NT1 was a great condenser mic for NT1, but the updated features of the NT1 fifth generation just might make it even more accessible to an entirely new generation of users. In fact, you're listening to me on it right now, so let's see what it offers and how it compares not only to the previous NT1, but to some other awesome mics as well. And the mic that you're listening to me on right now, the Rode NT1, I guess fourth generation, was my very first condenser microphone. I've always been really impressed by the sound and really my only complaint, my only qualm with this microphone is that it is very susceptible to plosives. Even when it's positioned kind of away from your mouth, it doesn't take much air or much breath to cause some plosives. So you definitely need to use a windscreen or a pop filter with it and then it can handle those plosive problems perfectly. And the same is pretty much true for the NT1 fifth generation. My fourth gen NT1 is also in this older style shock mount, which I don't think Rode makes anymore. But the biggest benefit to this shock mount is that it came with this metal mesh pop filter, which I really love and I think works really, really well. But for the microphones themselves, physically, they're nearly identical. So let's go back over here to the NT1 fifth generation. Now Rode did send me this for free, but as always, I don't have to make a video about it. I don't have to say anything about it. Nobody gets to watch this video first. There's a whole page on my website that kind of outlines how I handle these sorts of things. So this video is not sponsored. And while I do think that this is an excellent microphone overall, there are definitely some things I don't like about it and definitely some weaknesses, which we will be talking about in this video. But before we get into all that, what do you get with the NT1 fifth generation? I think that there are a few different like kits and combinations that you can get it with, but the one that I have came with the microphone itself, I know, shocking, a shock mount, the pop filter, a USB-C cable, which we will be talking about in a little bit, and a really long red XLR cable, which is great. I'm really excited to see XLR cables from Rode. This one has worked really well for me so far. It seems like it's well built. It has Neutrik connectors, which do the trick. There's no static and popping and fuzzing. So that's a pretty decent little kit that you get. I have had people tell me that they prefer this old style shock mount and they wish this was still available. I do like the way this looks. It's very space agey and has this little pass through part here where you can run your cable if you want to. But honestly, after using both of these for quite a while now, this is definitely an inferior design to the new one. And even this shock mount is not that new. They've been even shipping the older NT1s in this for a long time. This is a really well-made shock mount. It's basically all metal, including the mounts, both for the pop filter and to connect it to a stand or a boom arm. And Rode does this really awesome thing with their mounts and microphones like the pod mics where the mount has a 5 8 3 8 sort of adapter just built into it. So you don't need any adapters. You can put it on a boom arm, put it on a mic stand, and you don't have to fumble or worry about adapters. I love this design and it seems like nobody else does it and it's really smart. Another nice thing about this shock mount is that the screw on the bottom is connected to it. So when you take the microphone out, it, well, I'll show you. On the old one, when you would take out the microphone, this little part comes off and it's very heavy and metal. So if it falls on something, especially something delicate, it can actually cause a bit of damage. If the microphone's not on the shock mount, this is a very easy thing to lose. It's honestly, it's a small detail, but it's really annoying. Really the only thing about this shock mount that's not quite as nice is the pop filter itself, but it still works really well. And the cool thing about it too, let me go to this microphone. A really cool thing about this is not only can you articulate the pop filter like this, but you can then also articulate the screen there so you have a lot of versatility and there's this little uh, thing here where you can telescope it up and down so you have a lot of flexibility in positioning the pop filter and this is sort of a just a bit of magic that i appreciate the road logo is on this pop filter but it's going in the right direction on both sides which makes sense but you can't see the other one through it like you would think that I would also see the R over this E. I don't know how they did that. I don't know how you can't see the logo. It has zero effect on the microphone. I just think it's kind of a cool trick. Now the NT1 fifth generation is a large diaphragm condenser microphone, which means that the capsule inside is really, really big. And that's great because it helps capture a very crisp, bright sound with plenty of gain. And you're, you're basically always gonna get a loud enough signal with this microphone. Since it is a condenser microphone, you do need phantom power to run it. But I always think that's a great thing because basically every XLR interface or mixer can provide phantom power, which means whether it's a, a very inexpensive entry level interface or a really high end mixer, you'll be able to use this microphone with pretty much any of those devices. I just really love the way that this sounds. I've been using it 
for a couple of months at this point on a lot of different projects, and I really, really like this microphone sound. Just like the previous NT1, it is still a side address microphone, so you speak into the front of it, and you can tell which side is the front because it has that gold dot. Even though the physical size and design is almost the same between these two microphones, the new one, the fifth generation, is slightly lighter than the old one. It's about 50 grams lighter, which is actually kind of noticeable when you hold it. I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, it's just a thing. And it comes in a silver option or this black option, but I really like the black option because I think that this silver mesh at the top looks really cool. Like on camera, I think that this looks really, really nice. I love the pop of silver. I do like it more than just the all black. Yes, I do care about what microphones look like. I know that it has nothing to do with the sound. I'm the same person who has spent like a million dollars on colored windscreens for microphones. I care about how a microphone looks. It makes them fun to use when you like the way that they look. I'm sorry. And then the biggest new addition that you're gonna see on the NT1 fifth generation is in the connector on the bottom. It is what Rode calls dual connect because believe it or not, there are dual connectors in there. You have your XLR connector as you would expect, but there's also a USB-C port because this can be used as a USB-C microphone with your computer or really with any device that has a USB-C input. This is a very cool design because it's so compact and so space efficient and it works really well with like the road cables that come with the microphone. The only downside is that some other cables might not fit because it's a very, very tight, very specific fit. So definitely the road cables work well, but otherwise if you have other USB cables, they may or may not fit. It's really kind of the only downside to that design, but otherwise, it's super cool and it works really, really well. So now let's look a little bit more in depth at the NT1 fifth generation versus the previous one. I know there are a lot of other NT1 microphones. In fact, I think the NT1, if I'm not mistaken, was Rode's very first microphone, the original NT1. And I guess this is the fourth generation. So when I say the old one, I'm talking about the fourth generation NT1, the one that was available up until the fifth generation was released. The fifth generation has an MSRP of $249. Now, as far as sound quality between these two microphones goes, Rode has said that there is no difference. It's the classic NT1 sound, which is a very popular, very good sound. It's definitely one of my favorite sounding microphones. And you've been listening to me for a long time, most of the time on the fifth generation. Let's go back to the old one now. So this is the new fifth generation NT1, and this is the fourth generation, the old NT1. Both of these are just running into the Rodecaster Pro 2 on the generic microphone setting with no effects and no processing. So this is just their natural sound. And I do think there's a difference. So again, this is the old NT1. This is what the old one sounds like. And this is the new NT1. It is very subtle, but to my ears, I think that there is a difference. If you're watching this with headphones or on a nice sound system, you might be able to hear it more. Here's the fifth generation. And again, here is the old one, the fourth generation. They're both excellent sounding microphones, but if I had to pick, for some reason, I do lean towards this one, the fifth generation. I think that it does sound a little bit better. That's just personal preference, so there's no right or wrong. I just really like the way that this sounds, and I found myself over the past couple of months using this microphone more than I expected because it does sound so good. Of course, every mic kind of depends on different voices. If you wanna know what it sounds like on a preset, there is no specific fifth generation preset, but there is an NT1 preset. So this is the default microphone sound with no processing. And this is the microphone with the NT1 preset. Um, it's, I don't know if there's a huge difference. This sounds a, lot, a little bit more processed and compressed and crisp, but I really like the presets in the Rodecaster Pro 2, even if it's not the exact microphone. Sometimes I use like my Earthworks microphone with the NT1 preset and it sounds great. So this is with the preset and this is back to no preset with about 29 decibels of gain. So I'm only using 29 out of the available 76 decibels of gain in the Rodecaster Pro 2 on both of these microphones. So like I said, by far the biggest difference between these two microphones is that USB functionality built into the fifth generation. It adds a ton of versatility to the mic and makes it more accessible to people who either don't have or don't want to deal with an external interface or a mixer. It'll show up as an audio input output option as soon as it's connected to your computer or pretty much any device with a USB-C input. You'll just need to go into your sound settings to adjust the gain, which is kind of a hassle since there is no physical gain dial on the microphone itself. There are no physical controls on the microphone itself. And even though it's plug and play, I will put a link to Rode's user manual in the description to this video because it's very in-depth and very detailed and does have some links and tips if you are having driver issues or compatibility issues. I've not had anything like that, but just in case, 
that will be in the description. So now I've got the microphone running through USB into my computer. And what's awesome about this is that even though it is a plug and play microphone, you can then use Rhodes Connect and Rhodes Central apps as the central connection location for the mic itself. This includes all kinds of EQ adjustments and settings. Rode Connect is essentially a virtual Rodecaster Pro, and you can even connect multiple Rode USB mics to it and use them simultaneously with no lag and no delay or latency or anything like that. And even just in the Rode Central app, the processing that you see for the NT1 fifth generation, as long as it's not set to 32-bit float mode, this does go away if it's set to the 32-bit float mode. But if you're in just the normal microphone mode, all of the processing is exactly the same as you would see when connected to the Rodecaster Pro 2. And, and what's also really cool is that those settings do save to the microphone itself, which means if you connect it to your computer, you open up Rode Central, you get the microphone dialed in how you like it to sound, and then you disconnect it and plug it into another computer or device that doesn't even have those apps installed, it should still sound the way that you set it. That does not apply to the XLR functionality though, that is entirely dependent on the mixer or interface that you have it connected to, or the software that you have your mixer or your interface running into. Now those features are all really cool, but by far the biggest benefit I think to the USB functionality of the NT1 fifth generation is the addition of 32-bit float audio. I've talked about 32-bit float in a few other videos, but basically what it means is it becomes very, very difficult, if not almost impossible to clip your audio or have your audio be too low. If you're a photographer or somebody who works with video and you've worked with raw photos or raw videos, it's kind of easy to think of 32-bit float audio the same way that you would a raw photo or raw video. There's just a lot more information there and it gives you a lot more flexibility when it comes to editing. So if you've ever clipped your audio before where it looks like the tops of the waveforms have been clipped off by a pair of scissors because the signal was too loud, then you know it's a pain because there's really nothing you can do to fix that or make that audio sound good. Right now I'm speaking at a normal volume into this microphone, but if I raise the level, you'll see that the levels start to clip and there's nothing I can do in editing to fix this, so it just sounds awful. And here's an example of the opposite. If I turn my levels way, way down on the input, now you can barely hear me. It's this little whisper here. So in editing, if I go and try to make this louder, you're gonna notice a lot of hiss and noise being introduced into that signal. But with 32-bit float, you can recover clipped audio and boost low audio without losing any quality. The user guide that I mentioned earlier has specific walkthroughs on pretty much every DAW every audio editing application that supports 32-bit float audio. So if you can use that to set up whatever you're specifically using, but here's how to do it with Adobe Audition on a Mac, because that's what I use. The first step, once you have your mic connected, is to go to your sound preferences. You select the NT1 fifth generation as an input, and then you just adjust your gain level until it's at about 75% of that meter. From there, you need to go over to applications, go to utilities, and then click on audio MIDI setup. There you can select the NT1 fifth generation, and now you can choose 48 kilohertz, 32-bit float audio as the input. Next, we go over to Adobe Audition and create a new multi-track session. I'm gonna make sure the sample rate is 48,000. And then from here, we just make sure that the bit depth is set to 32-bit floats. So here are some examples of what you can do with 32-bit float. If I get really loud like this, when I see an audition, it looks like the audio is clipping. But when I'm editing, if I go through, I can restore that audio and still see the tops of those waveforms. If I get really loud like this, when I see an audition, it looks like the audio is clipping. The same is true in the opposite direction. If I talk really quietly, where I'm kind of whispering, and I'm sorry if this sounds weird, I can then raise that up without introducing a whole bunch of hiss and noise into the signal. So now you just hear the weird version of me talking and not hissy weirdness. So a big benefit to 32-bit float audio is I don't want to call it set it and forget it, but it really gives you a lot of peace of mind that you don't have to be totally dialed in absolutely perfectly on your audio levels to have things sound good. And if you're recording something where the volume changes a lot, things go from being really loud to really quiet, it gives you a lot of flexibility and again, a lot of peace of mind. I've been really happy to see 32-bit float making its way into more and more devices lately, microphones, recorders, and I don't know if it's possible, but I would really, really love some kind of update that brings 32-bit float recording to the Rodecaster Pro. And now I'm back on XLR mode with the NT1 fifth generation, and I would like to go into more microphone comparisons, but before we do that, I think it's important to talk about the comparison between dynamic and condenser microphones. 
This is a discussion that pops up a lot, especially when someone is looking into buying their very first serious microphone. My own personal opinion, and this might actually be a little bit controversial, is that the difference does not matter as much as people make it seem. There is definitely a difference in the way that condenser and dynamic microphones work and the way that they pick up sound, but for the most part, unless you're in like a big cavernous echoey warehouse, for most people who are putting together a home studio or an office studio, that difference is actually going to be quite a bit smaller than you might expect. And I think where the fear or the concern of condenser microphones comes in is that in general they're known to pick up more background noise, whereas dynamic microphones, you kind of need to be closer to them and they reject more background noise which is kind of true, but sometimes that's used as an excuse to just ignore sound treatment, and a dynamic microphone is not a replacement for good sound treatment. Now, for example, if I were doing something like I had a remote podcasting setup and I was traveling around and working with like different clients or setting up podcasting setups in different locations where I didn't have any control over those locations, I probably would choose to use something like the Shure SM7B in that setup because it does need to be really close to the speaker and just because of that, it's not going to be as sensitive to other sound in all these different environments. But I think what's more important is going with the microphone that you think sounds the best and that works with your voice the best, not the one that you think is going to prevent you from having to do sound treatment because any microphone in a poorly treated space is gonna sound like a microphone in a poorly treated space. And honestly, the room that I'm in right now isn't even all that well sound treated. It's okay, but it's, it's fairly average for just like, a normal sized room. And so just for reference now, this is me talking into the Shure SM7B with no noise cancellation or anything. So this is how it's picking up environmental sound. And then this is back over to the NT1 fifth generation. You can hear some environmental sound, or at least I can in my headphones. But to me, I would focus more on the difference in quality between these two microphones or whatever two microphones that you like the best and not which ones you think are going to magically noise cancel out all of your sound. So here we are back on the NT1 fifth generation. And again, this is all just my opinion, but in that debate between condenser versus dynamic, I think the best thing to do is go with the microphone that has the sound that you like the best, not the type of microphone that you think you should be using. Moving on now to the sound test. You've been listening to me a lot on the Rode NT1 fifth generation. So let's compare it to some other USB XLR combo mics, some other condenser mics, and just some other well-known microphones. So this is the Shure MV7. This is a dynamic microphone and it is an XLR USB combo mic. The downside is that with the USB functionality, it has a micro USB port it should have USB-C, but otherwise this is a very awesome microphone. I think it sounds pretty great. The only downside to it is that it is very susceptible to plosives and the windscreen that comes with it is not great. So I put one of the SM7B's windscreens on it. And now Peter Piper pitched a podcast. And because I get asked all the time, reporterstore.com is the website where I get all these windscreens, not associated with them at all. I've just bought like a lot of windscreens from them. But this is the Shure MV7, an XLR combo mic that has the same retail price, $249, as the NT1 fifth generation. And now we're back once again on the NT1 fifth generation, and the next one we're gonna look at is the Earthworks Ethos. It is not a combo microphone, it is only an XLR microphone, it is a condenser, and it has a retail price of $399. And this is the Earthworks Ethos. This is also just one of my absolute favorite microphones. Again, I'm not doing any processing or any effects on these. This is a condenser microphone, XLR only. It's more expensive than the NT1 fifth generation. But I, I have found personally that I think this is the least fatiguing microphone that I've ever heard. If you're doing something for a long period of time, you're going to do a very long hour or two podcast, you're gonna do a long live stream. This is the microphone, at least to my ears, or maybe just with my voice, that I don't get tired of listening to. Sometimes after a while, certain microphones can start to sound a little harsh or grating or boxy or unpleasant. The ethos just always sounds so good. I have a whole video about the ethos and the, the icon and Earthworks microphones. Maybe, maybe go check that out if you're interested. Once again, back to the fifth generation. The next microphone we're gonna be looking at is the Lewitt LCT240 Pro, another XLR only microphone, but one of my favorite condensers, and it also comes in at an amazing price. The MSRP is currently $139. So this is the Lewitt LCT240 Pro. I did a whole video on this and why I think it's such an underrated microphone because it really is 
it's so inexpensive. The only downsides really are that I definitely recommend getting the shock mount for it and a pop filter for it because it can be quite susceptible to plosives, but it is a great sounding microphone. One of my favorite sounding microphones ever. And it is a condenser, but it has this really tiny capsule, which sometimes can be viewed as a bad thing. But if you are somebody who has that, like, I'm scared of condenser microphones because they're gonna pick up too much environmental noise, this smaller capsule, I think, seems to do a really good job at not picking up any environmental sound. So it's like you get that condenser sound, but with the performance of a dynamic microphone and the price point is right and the sound quality is good, it's just, absolutely an awesome microphone. Back again on the NT1 fifth generation, moving again now from the LCT 240 Pro, let's go to the LCT 440 Pure, which is a, what is the retail price? $289 microphone. And the 440 Pure is basically the bigger sibling to the 240. It has a larger capsule, it has a significantly larger capsule in there. And it also has a different sound profile, but absolutely absolutely again an amazing microphone that i think sounds really really incredible you can't go wrong with either of these if you're looking for a really great sounding and relatively affordable microphone and since these aren't usb microphones if you're somebody who's ever used like the elgato wave 3 which i don't have and haven't used much but from what i understand Lewitt makes the capsules that go into the elgato usb microphones so if you like the way that Lewitt microphones sound but you want a usb version Maybe go check out one of the Elgato mics and you will gotta go, you El, you Elgato go get one. And once again, we're back on the NT1 fifth generation, even though you've already heard it a little bit ago, let's take another look at the Shure SM7B because it is surely one of the most popular microphones in the world. You do need to be really close to an SM7B to make it sound its best. And you usually need a lot of gain. Right now I have 60 decibels of gain running into the Rodecaster Pro 2 to power this microphone. If you don't have the Rodecaster or an interface with a lot of gain. You might need a booster like a Fethead or a Cloudlifter to get the gain that you need to get the performance that you want. One of the benefits, and you can probably hear it right now, is sort of how neutral, almost in a way dull, I would say the SM7B sounds just straight out of the box, but you do have the option to tune that. I like to flip one of these switches in the back here to kind of like change the presence a little bit and I like the way this sounds and then in the Rodecaster there is an SM7B preset so once you take that raw signal and you add a little bit of EQ to it you really start to get that really kind of classic SM7B sound of course every mic can be EQ'd to your tastes but I think the SM7B is a really good example of a microphone that's almost built to be that way it is so just like neutral on its own and then you can kind of season it to taste and that's definitely a strength of this Pretty legendary microphone. Now, as I said at the beginning of this video, I think that the Rode NT1 fifth generation is a really great microphone, but it is not perfect. And there are some areas, okay, as an XLR microphone, I think it's darn near perfect. I don't really have any, I, it sounds amazing. It's priced really well. It works really well. Really the only thing that I'm not crazy about is how susceptible it is to plosives, but you can combat that with mic positioning, pop filters and windscreens. And I don't know if it's even fair to say that that's a bad thing about the microphone because it just might be a quality of the microphone. Maybe to get this capsule in this grill, to get this sound, that's just sort of one of the compromises you have to make. And there are ways to mitigate that. So that's really the only downside if you're using it as an XLR microphone. It's as a USB microphone that I believe many balls have been dropped. No, it's as a USB microphone that I believe there are a lot of areas for improvement. The sound quality is awesome. So when you use this as a USB microphone, you're not losing any sound quality. It still sounds absolutely amazing, which is probably the most important thing. But the microphone has no physical controls of any kind, not even an LED anywhere on it to let you know that it's at least plugged in and being used. And most importantly, maybe even egregiously, there's no headphone output for zero latency monitoring. When I was recording with USB, you might have noticed I wasn't wearing my headphones because I can't monitor my audio with no latency. You can go into Rode Connect and sort of adjust your monitoring to do low latency, but it is not perfect. It's kind of annoying. It's a little distracting. And if you're doing anything, especially this is a microphone that is often used for music. If you're doing something that where timing is really critical and you're using it as USB, not being able to have zero latency monitoring, I think is a huge misstep. Now I would also prefer that it had more physical controls on it, at least some of the basics, a gain knob, 
maybe a mute switch, an LED to let me know that it's on. When it comes to these features, this, this microphone right here, the Sennheiser Profile, has my favorite assortment of controls for a USB microphone. We have a mute switch, we have LEDs, we have a physical gain dial, we have a mix to go between what I'm listening to in my headphones and what I'm hearing from the computer, if I'm playing back or talking to someone, and we have just a headphone volume control because we have a headphone output on this USB microphone, which I think all of these features are pretty critical to a good, well-functioning USB microphone, and this is less than half the price of the NT1 fifth generation. But maybe it's not fair to compare a Sennheiser microphone to a Rode microphone, so here is the Rode NT-USB another Rode USB microphone, which has headphone output, no physical gain control, unfortunately, but volume controls, a mix control, and a light inside, a blue light, that lets you know when it's on and plugged into USB power. And this is functionality that you see across most combo microphones. So, you know, everything from the Shure MV7 that we talked about earlier, it has not only the headphone output, yikes, but also you have volume and mix controls on the microphone itself. The Samson Q2U, uh, what is this, a 60 or $70 microphone, XLR USB combo microphone, you have a power switch and an LED, and you have volume controls for your headphones, no physical gain right here. The Samsung Q9U, XLR, USB, mic output. You have that kind of functionality in pretty much every USB XLR combo mic, except for this one right here. Even the new PodMic USB has all kinds of controls on the back of it. I don't know why those were emitted in this microphone, and I think the argument could be made but Tom, it's clearly an XLR first microphone with USB as kind of this nice emergency or secondary feature. And normally I would agree with you, except that there's so much functionality built in here. The compatibility with the Rode apps, and more importantly, that 32-bit float audio, that awesome flexibility of 32-bit float audio, I think really goes to show that Rode wants this to be an amazing USB microphone, and it is, but it needs those physical controls to really live up to that full potential because otherwise it can be kind of a pain to use and to set up as a USB microphone. But all that being said, I do still think that this is an amazing microphone. And like I said earlier, I have been genuinely impressed with the sound quality and I've used it more than I expected to just because of that. So even though it's not perfect, you're already getting an NT1, something that was already a really great microphone. And now I think you're getting slightly improved sound and you do have more functionality with all those USB features built right into it. It's not necessarily a groundbreaking, you know, revolution, but it's a really great refresh of a classic microphone to make it more compatible and more accessible to like the modern, you know, era of audio production, especially for smaller and independent home and office audio creators. If you've already got the older NT1, there's probably not really a reason to upgrade, but if you don't have that and you're looking for something, this is definitely a microphone worth considering because it is absolutely outstanding. And speaking of things that are absolutely outstanding, thank you to everyone who helps support my channel through Patreon and YouTube channel memberships. I can't tell you how it blows my mind that you're willing to do this, and I appreciate it, and thank you.